Welcome back to the Ed Morrissey Show podcast edition. I am very honored to introduce to you my guest today, uh, Father Robert Sirico, uh, who is co-founder of the Acton Institute, as well as a, 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 an accomplished author, accomplished uh, media analyst, and the author of a new book by Regnery, of course, Regnery being a unit of Salem, as we are here as well, The Economics of the Parables. And this is a book that's coming out this week, uh, and uh, and you can pre-order it now. Um, don't don't wait for it to hit your bookshelves. Go ahead and pre-order, get it going. Uh, Father Sirico, thank you so much for joining us today. Great to be with you, Ed. Thanks for having me. Well, you know, the Acton Institute does such great work on economics anyway, and and I know that the, you know you're co-founder of the Acton Institute. Uh, I know about the Acton Institute. In fact, when I was in Rome, I, I ran into a few people that were involved in the Acton Institute, which is great. Mm -hmm. But maybe we have you can an office there. Yeah, it, it, yeah, it's yeah. it's. Fantastic. Maybe you can start off by just telling us a little bit about the Acton Institute before we get into the book. Well, it was founded 32 years ago by myself and the co-founder, Chris Mowron, who is now the president. I'm the uh, president emeritus. Uh, and it was basically to do what I'm attempting to do in the economics of the parables, to create a dialogue between the market and uh, moral uh, values and theological insights. Uh, a kind of translation, if you will, between the two, because people think these are completely separate. So to do that, we started the Institute, we hold conferences, we produce books and uh, videos more, more and more. We've just done a, a new um, documentary on the whole situation in Hong Kong. So that's really what it is to kind of get, uh, bring uh, informed economic thinking to good intentions. And the economics of the parables is is exactly that effort as well. You go over the thirteen parables that speak in 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 part at least to economics, and you know with recognizing, of course, that there's a lot more than economics going on in the gospel. But oh yeah, yeah. But uh, but I mean, we we see people trying to draw lessons, and usually it's more or less the lessons that they want to draw for their own purposes yeah. from from parables and also from from acts and i mean we can get into that i'm sure that's you know that's not a parable but um we can get into that no but but the last part of the book i deal with a lot of these other economic things themes that run through the new testament that aren't parables and i do deal with the acts of the apostles in there as well but yeah. you're, you're it's important to start by understanding that i am not saying that the purpose of the parables is to teach economics right economics as an intellectual discipline comes later in history but what jesus does is use very practical um, instances from human life and then show the kingdom of god the transcendent kingdom of god from this reality and the backdrop of it is that he's making a lot of assumptions about economics that uh, i think uh, advocates of the free free economy would share so let's start there. I mean, what what uh, assumptions? <clears throat> excuse me. Do you see in the in these parables that Jesus teaches that um, that have that sort of understanding that free free market economics is a is the healthier direction for human economics? I think it's uh, you know in a real way it's the more natural and right. And that underscores the durability of the parables themselves. That in in using these examples of market activity or contracts or private property. Jesus is using the natural state of affairs that occurs in the world of scarcity. Scarcity is what gives rise to the necessity to allocate resources. If we didn't have scarcity, uh, we wouldn't have economics. There'd be no need for it. You wouldn't have to put a price on anything because you'd have, you could wait it out. <laughs> there's no, right. there's no but on your time or resources, you wouldn't have to uh, kind of produce or draw from the earth resources that would serve human needs. So all of this is there in the parables uh, and uh, supply and demand and contracts and labor shortages and productivity. And uh, all of these are in, in various um, parts of the parables. Right. And I mean, it gets, I mean, the parables talk about inheritance, you know, for instance, yeah. and, and, um, and the role of stewards, um, yes. rather than the role of ownership and wealth, which I think is actually one of the best ways of looking at, at, um, at property and, um, a relationship to, to wealth right. is ownership. Exactly. 
Yeah, we, we, we're entrusted with something, and you see that in the, the parable of the, the, the bad steward. <laughs> right, know, yes. Rip off his master. Uh, but you also see it in, in for instance, the, the stewardship of the, um, uh, the wealth that, that is entrusted to the, the workers in the vineyard or the talents uh to our, our they're given stewardship of money and they're asked to be productive with uh stewardship is really our relationship to the whole world and the parables are trying to use this world to point to a world that goes beyond this world right and, and it's the reason why i think sometimes people get lost in the um literal uh meaning of the parables right i mean and this is this you're asking people to go beyond the literal here to consider, oh, yeah. to consider, yeah. you know, what what this first off, what it meant historically. I mean, this is sort of like the four different ways to to um, to read gospel anyway, literally, historic, right. historically, you know, theologically, and that's uh, Saint yeah. Augustine, yeah. right? Exactly, and you frustrate yourself by looking at uh, the parables and thinking, well, now, what about this or that detail of it? because you're missing the point. The point isn't the story. The ambiguity of the story sometimes is precisely the point to get you to think more deeply and think of what the implications are for your life and for your response to whatever it happens to be, to the call of the gospel or to human needs or whatever. Well, that brings us to a, a more basic question. And I'll just, I'll just put this out here right now before we get back into the book, which is the question of why Jesus spoke in parables at all, right? And this question comes up in the gospels. There are times when the, when, when the disciples are asking this question too. And he says, you are given better understanding of this basically for a reason, uh, but right. I need to teach in this manner. And so I think that goes to your point about the, necess the necessity of that ambiguity, the necessity of people being able to unpack this for themselves. Also, he says, let, he has this very intriguing phrase, let him that has ears hear. Because yes. uh, he's speaking in a volatile context, you know, in some of these contexts, people are waiting to trip him up. And he uh, kind of cloaks what he's saying in a way that those who really aren't interested in the truth of this thing aren't going to hear what he's really saying about it. And so he entrusts it. But I think uh, another reason, and this distinguishes the parables from things like fables. Uh, these, this is not fantasy. This is the stuff of real life. Yep. And it's also what gives the durability of it. Because people, after all, still go fishing. They still plant seeds. They still uh, engage in contracts. They still have bills to pay. Uh, all of these things still exist, and that's why they're so, it's so durable that we can grasp what Jesus is saying and uh, kind of apply it to our own circumstance. So getting back into the book, and the book is The Economics yes. of the Parables by Father Robert Sirico, who's here with us right now. Uh, my friend Peter Grandich, who's a Catholic uh, econo uh, economist, he's somebody who appears regularly both on my podcast and on Relevant Radio, is a great guy. Is, yes. is is very much his 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 main message now is about debt and the uh, gospel uh, warnings about debt and what yeah. the uh, you know how how debt is never looked that well in the scriptures what what do the parables tell us about debt and and you know how do they speak to that well of course uh, we're all indebted in one way or another right, right now the right. particular um, uh, parables here, particular lessons about debt. I'm thinking of the the story of the 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 men who receive, uh, the one who both both. I'm sorry, there are two men who are indebted to a king and they can't pay. Right. And the king forgives them both, uh, or forgives the one, and that one goes and holds the other one who's indebted to him to a greater. Uh, standard. In other words, it's not as generous. So uh, I think what your economist friend is getting to is a different point. And that is the fact that when we are in debt, uh, what we are spending on, what we are living on, is the generosity uh, of another person. We're living on somebody else's property. So we should even be more careful 
with what we have inherited from that person, what we borrowed from that person, than our own. Uh, you know, we can be frivolous with our own resources, but you, you don't have the right, the moral right, to be frivolous with somebody else's resources. So there's a bond of trust there as well. And then there are uh, other forms of debt that might not be immediately thought of as debt. And I'm thinking of the, the uh, parable of the prodigal son. The, yes. the, takes his inheritance. Uh, that's a form of debt. He has a debt to his father now, uh, if it's nothing more than a moral debt. And it's interesting in that parable, because he goes and he squanders what he has, and he comes back, and it's the older son who is really ticked off because he says, you know, I've been here all this time slaving for you, and you've never let me have the fatted calf, and you've never let me have a party for my friends. And it's interesting to see that both of these sons are looking at the father in a very similar way. I mean, neither of them come out looking good. I know a lot of people feel bad for the, the, the older son uh, because, you know, I mean, he was there the whole time. But it, it really is kind of like um, a lesson in gratitude. And it, it, we call it the, 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 the parable of the prodigal son, but it's really the, the parable of the benevolent, benevolent or the loving father. Because what we're trying to do is take both of his sons and bring them in, bring them together, uh, reconcile them to his own love. And those are forms of debt. Father, I'm really glad you brought up the older brother because I've always found the older brother to be the most fascinating part of the parable of the of the he prodigal is. son. And, and he's the one who's still on the outside at the end. By the way, this is the ambiguity of the Gospels. It doesn't end. We don't really know what the end of that was. Does he come in? Doesn't he come in? You know, you can imagine it both ways. You can imagine him brooding in the darkness uh, all by himself and isolated, finding himself in the same position as his younger brother was in in the pigsty. Or you can Im imagine him just letting it go and coming in and embracing his brother. You know, I say that um, the struggle there is uh, he suffered from uh, Italian Alzheimer's. It's where you <laughs> think, but, but the grudge. <laughs> <laughs> and you can destroy yourself with that. Yeah. Yeah, indeed. And and I I mean there's lots of different paths. I can say that, that because I'm an Italian. That wasn't a hate crime. No, well, I'm I'm Italian on my mother's side. Really, I am Italian on my mother's side. So I, I am I am right there with you on that, uh, Father Sirico. Um so let's get a little bit more into I mean, I could go on this one parable. And maybe we'll just come sure, back and do a sure. podcast on just this one parable because I've just got all right. sorts of thoughts. But I want to really get to the book, The Economics of the Parables, that um that is coming out this week. And, you know, let's talk a little bit about the parable of the talents, right? Because I think this is also a parable that people have difficulty um, grasping. Tell us a little bit about what the economics of this are and how the economics sort of unpacks this, this parable. Well, the basic story here, because the, the number of the parables are told in various gospels. So right. we get confused and the parable of the talents is told one way in one gospel, one way in another. But the basic line of thought is the um, owner comes and leaves resources with these servants. Uh, in the one, uh, he leaves five talents. By the way, that word talent is an economic unit. Today, we understand it in our common usage, it's a gift that we have, an ability that we have. But originally, we, this is where we get the word talent from, from the scriptures. So he entrusts the these monetary units to these three, five, two, and one. And he goes off, and they go out, the two of them go out and are productive, and they double the income. The one hides the money now it's important to understand that he doesn't lose the money right he hides it he buries it and when the master comes back you have this dialogue he he you know celebrates the productivity of the first two but he comes to the other one he's very harsh with him and he says what did you do you could have even if you just put it in the bank and got some some interest on it you could have done something with it but you didn't and here's what's very intriguing it's the response of this one, what he says, why he didn't do it. And I think it, in a way, uh, 
exemplifies the attitude that much of the socialist ideology has uh, toward free commerce, toward investment and productivity. Because first he says, I was afraid. And, you know, if you don't have a sense of risk aversion, uh, or I'm um, sorry, if you, if you don't put aside risk aversion, you can't be successful in a market. So this man is afraid, and he's afraid because of his perception of who the master is. I knew you were a cruel man, gathering where you have not sown and gathering where you had not scattered. So what he's saying is, I knew that you exploit people. You, you're not really productive. You gather things. And this is exactly what Marx's accusation is against uh, entrepreneurs or, or capitalists. So he has this, this mentality. Uh, what I think, and getting to the, the point I men mentioned earlier about the ambiguity of these parables, and some, most all of them have some part of it that you don't, it's not quite told. I wonder what would have happened had the master come back and the two who were productive said, look, we invested your money in. These looked like great investments, but they failed. What would have happened? Yeah. Uh, the master's reaction have been uh, to that. And, and I think because what we very often forget is that not every market failure is a moral failure. If you've done your due diligence and you've done the best you can do, and a storm comes and destroys the, the buildings, for instance, or, you know, this disrupts the supply lines. That's not a moral failure on your part. And I think that's a, an important lesson against the prosperity gospel preachers, because the prosperity gospel preachers say that wealth is a sign that God is blessing you. And I don't I don't believe that. Right. I, you know, uh, it's in a in in a way the prosperity gospel is the flip side of liberation theology. Uh, liberation theology demonizes uh, wealth, and prosperity gospel canonizes uh, wealth. And so the, these are two erroneous approaches to economics and and theology. Both, right. And uh, um, prosperity gospel tends to demonize poverty, too. I should, I also, I'm sorry, know, did I say demonize wealth? Demonize poverty, yes. No, no, you said you said canonize wealth. So I'm just I'm just yeah, yeah, providing right. the parallel to that. Yeah, which is, exactly. you know, which is clearly not the message that Jesus is sending in the Gospels. You know, it's, 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 it's about serving the poor. It's about serving the needy, which, you know, brings right. us again back to the parables where you have, yes. um, you know, significant teachings here about caring for the poor. I and mean, we're not just talking about the Good Samaritan, we're talking about a number of these parables. Right. The Good Samaritan is another another great one, you know. Right. Uh, this man who invests himself personally in the uh, care of someone whose body is broken, whose life is in danger. And it's interesting that the Good Samaritan, that Jesus holds up this man who's an outsider socially, but is also a businessman because he's he's going on this road to Jericho back and forth. He's known by the innkeeper uh, and he's willing to invest himself personally. You have this this sense of his physical embrace of this man, lifting him up, putting him on his own animal, taking him to the inn and in effect, giving the credit card to the innkeeper and say, you take care of him. Uh, and if you spend any more than this, uh, I'll make it up to you on my way back. So it's interesting that Jesus, this is antithetical in my mind uh, to the welfare state. This is the call for us to be personally, grittily involved uh, in, in people's lives. You know, uh, on, on the question of wealth, by the way, a third of this book deals with other economic themes that you find in the New Testament. Uh, our friends at Regnery were surprised to see a full third of the book was dealing not with the parables. But I thought it was important as I was thinking it through. And, and one of the examples that I came up with, um, or that as I, as I was thinking, where, where do you see economics elsewhere in the New Testament? It's the call of the rich young ruler that you find in the gospel. It's very interesting because uh, as you think about that passage in most people's minds, there are a lot of assumptions that we have. For instance, one of the assumptions 
is that the first thing Jesus says to him is, give away all your property. That's not what Jesus says. The first thing Jesus says to this man is, sell all that you have. Yep. And then give to the poor. It doesn't even say give it all to the poor, but let's say it's all to the poor. If this man is going to really benefit the poor, he's going to have to be successful in negotiating the sale in the liquidation of his property. So this shows you the, the way you become a good servant is to be uh, a good negotiator. But We're then, go ahead. I was going to say, that gets us back to stewardship, right? Exactly. Exactly. That's part of it. It's a very subtle part of it. People miss it. But then you get the most famous, I think probably one of the most famous uh, metaphors uh, in the New Testament, how hard it is for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. Uh, it, you know, it's easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle than a rich man to get into the kingdom of heaven. And this shocks the disciples because they say to, to Jesus, well, then who can get into heaven? Now, whenever I'm asked this, this is the single most frequently asked question when I'm giving a lecture, is this camel in the eye of the needle? I always ask them, the, the interlocutor or the audience, what was the next thing Jesus says? When the disciples say, who can get into heaven? People don't remember. <laughs> All things are possible. All things exactly. Are possible. Yeah. Exactly. You're one of the rare ones who, who, who followed that. All the, oh, maybe you've read the book. <laughs> I, you know, occasionally, probably not enough, though. <laughs> but, <occasionally. laughs> but because it's only possible with God's grace, with his love. And that's the whole lesson. That's the gravamen of this story, is that you can't buy heaven. You can't trade your way into heaven. It, it has to come by grace, and that we're comes back to the question of stewardship. We're stewards of what we are entrusted with. So, getting to another part, you're talking about the 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 servant who hid the the single talent in the field and was chastised by by the um, Un unproductive. Uh, yeah, as unproductive. There's another parable where it's kind of celebrated that you, somebody hid a treasure in a field, right? It's, it's this that parable of the hidden treasure in the field. And I love that one. Yeah, it's a, it's a great parable, but I am interested in seeing how you unpack that in terms of economics. Uh, well, the hidden treasure in the in the field is is interesting. To go back again to this question of the um, ambiguity that we see in these gospels because there's a lot that's not said. Uh, what is not said is, how did that treasure get into that field? Was it, was it just, and what was the treasure? Was it a, a, a bag of gold? Was it, you know, and then he goes and he buys, he sells everything he has and he buys the property. Now, he doesn't just take the treasure. Right. He buys the property. And so there's that ambiguity gives us a lot to meditate on, a lot to think about. But one of the things that jumps out at me in terms of the economic uh, insights is that all of um, entrepreneurship is the process of discovery. What an entrepreneur does is discover um, a process whereby things that were there are combined perhaps in a slightly different way to create something that wasn't there before. And that becomes useful to other people. Uh, that's really what economic profit is. It's, it's showing that you have been a servant to other people, that people value what you have done. So entrepreneurship as a discovery process. Uh, and uh, I, I think that's really key. Um, the treasure, of course, a treasure is very often spoken of in the scriptures as wisdom. Yep. And what, what this man is discovering is, is wisdom. Now, you could, if you were a socialist, say he's taking advantage of the market. He's taking advantage of the ignorance of the person who owned the field. And in a sense, that's right. But is that exploitative? Um, everyone who runs a restaurant is taking advantage of the hungry, hung, uh, the hunger of other people. Everyone who who uh, manufactures clothes is taking advantage 
of the nakedness of, of people who come and buy those clothes. The question is, what the social benefit? If that man left the treasure in the ground, there would have been no social benefit to the hidden treasure. Right. It, that he takes it out of the ground and does it honestly by buying the, uh, the property. That was going to be my point, is it also shows the um, the requirement for proper investment, right? Because the the simplest thing would have been he found the hidden treasure in the field, plucked it out and, you know, and, and took it with them, which would have been theft, right? In this right. case, right. If, if you're looking at it from an economic standpoint, anyway, this is somebody who actually went all in and in investing in that mm -hmm. property so that he could he could morally legally benefit from that treasure. Um, and, and I think that that's an, to your point, I think that's a very important aspect of that there's particular another, parable, yeah. There's another overlap of both the moral and the economic dimensions. And that would be what was required of this man was attentiveness and vigilance. Uh, and, and that applies both in our spiritual lives which is, of course, the supreme point of these parables. It's, it what tra it's what transcends this material world. But it also applies in, in the market. You have to be attentive to the market. You don't just throw your money out there and expect it to come back uh, multiplied. You have to see if these investments are solid investments. And so it's, I think you get this, uh, this kind of overlap of both the practical and uh, that is the economic and the moral. Uh, Father Sirico, I, I, I've got one more quick question for you. I got actually, I have a guess for you here. You mentioned that the the question you get asked most is the passage about how much more easy it is for a camel to pass through the eye of the needle than it is for a rich man to enter right. the kingdom of heaven. May I guess that the second most common question you get asked in these presentations is um, why we shouldn't follow Acts of the uh, Acts of the Apostles, at, which is not a parable, right. but you you, you, you address no. this, uh, and, uh, and, and simply divide all the all the stuff between everybody and sort of uh, go in for communism or socialism. Yeah, well, I mean, that's what Marx thought. Marx thought that Acts of the Apostles was primitive socialism. Uh, actually, I think it was Engels who, who said that. But uh, of course, it shows that neither of them were very good exegetes because they didn't <laughs> Acts. They're just taking, taking this one thing out of Acts 2, but they don't follow the whole line of uh, the thought because there's an example a little later on in Acts that says of where this is actually happening. They would come and deposit the money at the feet of the apostles. And among the people who were depositing the money were a couple, Ananias and Sapphira, and they owned a field. And they went out and they sold the field and they brought back a part of the money and deposited at the feet of the apostles. And St. Peter is the one who gives the capitalist defense, if you will. I'm, I'm, I'm playing with words now because right. capitalism didn't exist then, right? But St. Peter says, uh, when you sold the property, was it not your own? And after you sold it and acquired the money, did it not remain your own? In other words, he's affirming private property. This is your property. The problem is you lied right. to the Holy Spirit, and then they get their punishment. So uh, Peter himself <laughs> says, no, this was not socialism in the sense that socialism is coercive, right. not voluntary. Um, Churchill said that the socialism of, of the early Christians, the Acts of the Apostles, said everything that is mine that I have is yours. And the modern socialist says, everything that you have is mine. And this is this is the whole perversion of Christianity in the name of socialism. Well, Father Robert Sirico, it's been a pleasure talking with you. I could do this for another hour or so, but you've got other Thank things you, to do. But Thank you. Acton Institute, where can, first off, where can people find Acton Institute? Acton.org, A-C-T-O-N.org, and a plethora of material, films and books and conferences oh, yeah. like. Oh, yeah, it's, it's great. Acton.org. And don't forget to pick up The Economics of the Parables by Father Robert Sirico. It's on sale. Well, this week it's on sale. And, uh, pre order pre order uh, on um, Amazon, and you'll get it the same day as the bookstores will have it. 
There you go. You can beat the bookstores, which is... Don't you love capitalism? I love capitalism. <laughs> I absolutely love capitalism. Father Robert Sirico, thank you so much for being with us today. God bless you. Thanks. God bless, sir. We'll be back with more from the Ed Morrissey Show right after this. This is Ed Morrissey of HotAir.com for Town Hall. In George Orwell's dystopian masterpiece, 1984, Big Brother manipulated the masses through the Ministry of Truth. Joe Biden and Homeland Security Chief Alejandro Mayorkas propose a real-life version in its new Disinformation Governance Board, an unintentionally ironic name. The new board's mission will focus not just on foreign sources of disinformation, a task more suited to intelligence services, but also on issues related to Joe Biden's border crisis. It's not hard to see where this effort will lead. It became even more clear when Mayorkas appointed Nina Jankowicz as its new executive director. Her experience at governing disinformation includes her public insistence that the Hunter Biden laptop story was, quote, a Russian influence op, end quote, and a fairy tale. She was simply wrong. Even aside from Jankowicz's partisan track record of misinformation, the federal government has no business interfering in the free and fair exchange of ideas in a free republic. Congress must put an end to Biden's new Orwellian speech police. Remember, after all, the First Amendment. I'm Ed Morrissey. Welcome back to the Ed Morrissey Show podcast edition. Um, Somebody we never have on ever is Andrew Malcolm who doesn't write at Red State, who isn't known as the Prince of Twitter or the Regent of Red State, and uh, who is um, inevitably uh, at at odds with with everything that we say and do. Now, none of that is actually true. (laughs) Yeah, that's disinformation. Isn't that disinformation? Yes, it is. Well, that's the topic of today's podcast. One of the topics, anyway, of today's (laughs) podcast. Misinformation. Otherwise known, uh, I mean, and Andrew's column on this is is perfect. But uh, but you know, it's that's the that's the um, the snooty word for lies. <laughs> yeah, right. That's uh, <laughs> let's go up down and uh, you know, Mark Twain called lies stretchers, and and uh, that's kind of a country, a polite country term for you're not saying the truth, bro. But uh, yeah, there's a lot of that going around. Well, there is a lot of that going around. There's apparently a lot of it going around in Washington, D.C. Not just a lot of disinformation, but a lot of disinformation about disinformation. And uh, it's very meta in in the Beltway, Andrew. We now have a disinformation governance board, which if if you take this literally, it sounds like they're trying to govern through disinformation. Which I think they might yeah. be doing, yeah, Andrew. Yeah, I mean, there's a good bit of that going on too. Yeah, I, and and the the cherry on top is Barack Obama. Yeah, <laughs> master of disinformation, giving a speech at Stanford, for which I'm sure he was paid handsomely, uh, denouncing disinformation and calling for drastic measures to end it. This is the guy who promised 37 times that you could keep your doctor if you wanted to, uh, that we would have $2,500 at least in savings under Obamacare. The guy who promised swift justice after Benghazi, and we're still waiting. Uh, The guy who promised that Al-Qaeda was on the run. The guy who told Mitt Romney uh, that the 1980s called uh, and the Cold War is over. Um, I mean, the guy who sucked up to Putin with his reset and canceled the missile defense uh, system in Eastern Europe without even telling the allies who had agreed to it precariously. Uh, I mean, this guy is a real piece of work. Uh, and um, uh, it's, you know, it's convenient to get to, it gives you a crutch since they, Biden people and Obama can't talk about much that Obama's done or that Biden's done. So they got to talk about the bad things other people are saying. And, you know, Ed, if only people listened to the long list of accomplishments by the Biden administration and the Democrat Congress, 
Uh, oh, wait a minute. Ding, 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 ding. I, I, <laughs> I've just been, uh, this is, this is an alert from the disinformation governance board. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If only they listened, these poll numbers would not be so stinky. Um, you know, I, I, I have to say that I am very impressed that the, that the guy who once claimed on the campaign trail that Republicans quote, we're going to put y'all back in chains and yeah. who just what just like two or three months ago. Uh, claimed that um, that uh, Joe Manchin and Kirsten Cinema and anybody else who opposed eliminating the filibuster were um, racists and white supremacists. Yeah, I, I I trust that guy to run a disinformation governance board. That's that's the guy I put my trust in, Andrew. You know, yeah, and and perversely, his def the assumed defense is that he's not all there. Hello, wait a minute. <laughs> You know, I mean, it's this is really scary. And oh, I had a quote, but it's missing. Wait, where did it go? I had a, uh, oh, right. I had a quote. Joe Biden, Joe Biden today. Uh, well, it's on my timeline. Um, uh, she um, she gave a speech at the Metropolitan Museum of of Art. I, I actually think the Metropolitan Museum of Art. There, no, I'm thinking the Museum of Modern Art. Never mind. I was going to make a. I was going to make a. I was going to make a, a joke about modern art being a a form of disinformation too. But you know that's uh, yeah, that, that, yeah, that's yeah. just that's just me being. There you go. Yeah, whatever. But anyway, she gave this speech, and the first line of her speech has an unintended meaning, I think, for most of us who are watching her lead her husband around by the hand. She says. No matter the words we choose or the speeches we give, the world sees the totality of who we are. Oops. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, oh. That's that that that's that's a long way around. Actions are speak louder than words, but okay, you know that's uh, that's it's yeah. profound. It's very profound. Uh, yeah, people are seeing Joe Biden for what he is, which is sort of an authoritarian creep. <laughs> And, yeah. and yeah. this is, I, you know, you have people who are saying, oh, well, this is really no big deal. This isn't that big of a deal. The disinformation governance board is really just going to focus on, on, on foreign sources of information. I promise you that we're not going to look at U.S. citizens, to which the rest of us go, yeah, wasn't that what James Clapper was saying about, uh, <laughs> about, the, about the whole um, expansion of uh, NSA uh, yep. uh it wasn't it wasn't that exactly what he was saying and then turned out uh, that that was also disinformation yeah they're really good at this um uh you know they i don't know i don't know what to say anymore and i guess we we all we can't rely on the fourth estate to be a whistleblower anymore so i really don't know other than you and me and uh, and a band of uh, of our brothers and sisters. Who, who's going to blow the whistle on this stuff? You know, uh, I, you know. Actually, I, I will say this, and I don't know if you got a chance to read it or not. But Jack Schaefer in Politico actually had a really good article about this. And I mean, Jack Schaefer is no, not. He's good. He's good. He's good. He's not a conservative by any stretch of the imagination. I don't think he's really a hardcore liberal either. I think he's a. I think he's an H. L. Mencken. Which is basically he thinks everybody's idiots, <laughs> so he's going to yeah. point out he's going to point out how everybody's an idiot. Um, but he does it very well. In fact, if I had to pick an H. L. Mencken uh, for our era that wasn't named Andrew Malcolm, I think yeah. I probably would pick Jack Schaefer because yeah, I think no, he's he very well. good. He's very. Yeah. I learn a lot of stuff when I read his uh, his column, and he, the the thing I particularly like is he's got a uh, an historical perspective. Yes. Un unlike 99% of the crowd in DC today, they, uh, you know, I guess they don't require history anymore. So we miss out on it. Well, yes, that comes from being older than dirt though, which also yeah. <laughs> applies to yeah, you okay. and me too, but you know, <laughs> yeah, right. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, isn't that what grandfathers were invented for? I, I think mean, you're right. come on. I think you're right. But, um, uh, you know, the um, but I mean, he makes a number of good points about this. First off, he sort of scoffs at the idea that this is only going to be limited to foreign sources of disinformation. 
Secondly, he said, the problem with a federal disinformation governance board is that a lot of disinformation comes from the federal government. Yeah. It, and yeah. it used to be the media's job <laughs> to ferret that out rather than right. amplify it. And so very much, not even an implied criticism of the media, but the fact that the media has just sort of dropped the ball on that particular respect, especially especially in this administration. This brings me to another Politico article, which wasn't nearly as good, but certainly was remarkable. Did you see the one where the Politico, uh, I think it was in Politico magazine, uh, where they were complaining that the White House beat now is boring? Yeah. It's, did you see this? Yeah. Like, yeah. Oh, well, the, 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 yeah. there's nothing to do there. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. I know. They had access sometimes three, four, five times a day to Trump uh, and, uh, and Biden now. Oh, no, this is really boring. They're never happy. And really good press secretaries know this, and they sort of play to the hunger, and they look like they're championing. You know, I'll get back to you on that. Uh, without that stupid, I'll circle back. Circle back. <laughs> yeah. Um, and they're also advocates for the media to the boss. I mean, I know that. I was there um, in the campaign anyway, not in the White House. Um, so that's what the good ones do. And um, Ari Fleischer did it, did that, I think. Uh, and Dana, and uh, certainly Tony Snow. And, uh, you know, there have been good ones. Um, but um, the, the judgment on, on Saki is that um, she's good in the sense of defending Biden, but not in the sense of providing information, which is part of her job. You know, I mean, she said the other day they asked her, um, I forgot what it was, that uh, it was a good question. They asked her about such and such, and she said, uh, I don't have any information on that. So I tweeted, well, get some. I mean, right. <laughs> is that your job? <laughs> yeah, really. Yeah. So it's, but they it's let not her, just but disinformation. They let her see, but they let her go with that. It's not just disinformation. It's... Um... What's a good word for for no information? Lack of. Lack, lack of dearth, information. Dearth, a, dearth. A dearth of information. It's just a dearth of information. I want to quote this thing, though. It's called the rise and fall of the, uh, of the it's, was it rise and fall of the political star, of the uh, reporter star, star reporter? The rise and fall of the star White House reporter. A, a, a lament by Max Tanney. Um I, I want to quote one thing in here in particular, because this one stood out not just to me, but to a whole bunch of other people. Jen Psaki is very good at her job, which is unfortunate, one reporter who has covered the past two administrations from the room said. And the work is a lot less rewarding because you're no longer saving democracy from Sean Spicer and his men's warehouse suit. Just jawing with, uh, jawing with Jen just makes you look like an asshole. Well, only if you're... <laughs> only if you yeah. think that contradicting this administration's talking points is somehow or not even contradicting just questioning it somehow makes you look like an asshole that yeah. that tends to tell me andrew that they don't see their jobs as you know yeah. as holding truth so. you know hold, you know speaking truth to power or holding the, um, people accountable but they see their job as promoting certain narratives and, and if and if you watch the white house correspondence dinner oh it's such a suck up time i just yeah, I can't stand uh, that. Oh, I, I, I just, it's just so embarrassing to see alleged professionals there. I don't, you know, Tom Brokaw, to his credit, I hope he's in remission, but he, he, uh, he said he would never go. And, you know, I, I was never invited. And so, I, but <laughs> if I was, if I was, I would never go. I, I just so, uh, queasy makes it queasy these are people that are supposed to be questioning these folks on friday and monday and on saturday night they're sucking up cheering them standing ovations laughing at their jokes to which the president had nothing to do with writing uh you know biden's uh biden's line uh his first joke was uh well you know this is the first time in six years that we we we've been at this dinner uh, we had uh, oh, we had a long plague, and then two years of COVID. 
Yeah, whatever. I mean, I mean, I, well, I, I mean I, that's, that is, that's a speech writer. That's yeah. a, that, Joe Biden, he couldn't come up with that if you if Hunter gave him 20 percent. Well, <laughs> yeah. Now, now I want to read you another quote from here. And just to show you how how Max Tanney and Politico sort of missed the forest for the trees here. Right. This is from a different another reporter who covered both Trump and Biden from the White House room. Uh, White House press room. It's a boring and difficult job. It's tough to be a White House correspondent if you want to break news. They're so airtight. There's no Maggie Haberman. Who's the Maggie of the Biden administration? It doesn't exist. Okay, no. I agree. It doesn't exist, except for maybe Peter Ducey, but it doesn't exist. Why doesn't it exist? Yeah, <laughs> and exactly it's not, right. It's not because the Biden administration is so airtight. It's because you guys are are have fallen back. Not working into, at it. Yeah. They're, they're, sten, they're stenographers again. They're back to being stenographers. They were stenographers during the Obama administration. They were Woodward and Bernstein during the Trump administration, which I don't mind is if as long as they are as long as they remain in that mode, regardless of who's right. in the White House. Exactly right. Well, you know, uh, remember the big stink at the beginning of Trump when he said, you know, we don't need daily briefings. And, and, and it worked because the, the briefings would have contradicted his sometimes scattered messaging, messaging when he would go right. to the a helicopter or walk to the toilet or whatever, everybody would have a chance to talk to him. Um, he said, we don't need the briefings. And there was huge uproar in the White House press corps. Well, <laughs> not because they wanted access to information, it's because they gave them, it gave them something to do on a workday. Otherwise, they'd have to come up with it themselves. Yeah. It was, Amazing. I mean, it's, it's, it's hand feeding. Now, I'm not praising Trump for that because that's a real missing opportunity. He couldn't possibly, he should have had a really good press secretary um, who could speak for him um, all the time. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and set the message tone. Instead, Trump was walking on his own messaging yeah. of the day. Um, and he wanted to be in control. And he still does. By the way, just uh, before we uh, started taping, he announced he's going on May 28th. He's going to Wyoming for the Cheney, for a rally against the Cheney um, and uh, for uh, Margaret Hagedorn. So uh, he's putting some more uh, credibility on the line that day. Yeah, I guess so. I mean, I think he's, he's he's sort of squandered it a bit in Ohio when he couldn't name the guy he he couldn't name the guy he endorsed, right? No. Uh, you know, he endorsed uh, J D Vance, and he he said from the stump that is, uh, he something about endorsing J D Mandel. Uh, now Josh Mandel. Oh. Josh Mandel is one of J.D. Vance's competitors in the Ohio Senate primary. Doggone, I hate when that happens. Mandel was uh, was the one who spoke at CPAC. Yes, yes. Mandel's been Mandel's been running in Ohio um, statewide races for several oh, cycles. God. He's very well known, right? He's not yeah. an outsider. He's really kind of an insider. Uh, that's a, actually a really interesting Senate race, too. When, we, when I was filling in for Hugh Hewitt last week, we interviewed... Um, Dolan is it Michael Dolan I think is um was the yeah. candidate um but that could go I mean you got three or four candidates who are really within shouting distance of each other in that in that primary race Vance Mandel um uh, Dolan and I think Timken is still in the mix too so I mean that's a that'll be an interesting test of Trump's endorsement power um I think he's going to I think he's going to lose big time in Georgia on that. And, yeah, yeah. you know, so. But he seemed, I, I read something where he was kind of pulling back and being quieter about that. But well, I think he's, I think it's he's still going to tag. Yeah. Cause he knows what's going to happen, but yeah, cause Kemp's going to win in a blowout apparently. So yeah. Yeah. Kemp's Kemp's pretty popular. I would, we get the Georgia radio stations here and uh, he's uh He's got a, a a pretty good uh, pretty good image, and it's hard, you know, when you're in a. Uh, I'm not playing the violins uh, for Purdue, but it, it's hard if you're in a president's cabinet, to have much of an impact back home. 
Yeah. Because what you're doing is more important and national than, than you can as a, a member of Congress. No, I think that's right. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with you. I mean, that's one reason why you might want to really consider whether you want to run for governor coming out of a cabinet uh, immediately well, afterwards. Uh, but yeah. yeah, didn't I mean, Tom Vilsack, he was uh, he was a governor, longtime governor, I think, before yep. he was Obama's and he came back. He didn't go back and run against Joni Ernst or anybody. He came back in the cabinet again for Joe. Which is what's a smart move by Vilsack. And actually, if they followed Vilsack a little bit more often in that White House, they'd probably do all right. And speaking of disinformation. <laughs> so let's let's take a look at another media meme um, that has sort of unfolded of late, which is the Daily Mansion update. I mean, I don't know if you're I don't know if you are are noticing, but. Every single day now, we get a story about how Democrats are finding it difficult to negotiate with Joe Manchin. I mean, I, it may not be quite every single day, but it's damn near every single day. One major media outlet or another will have, and sometimes more than one, will have the latest update on, we just can't figure out what Joe Manchin wants. Even though Joe Manchin <laughs> is talking to reporters in the hallways explaining exactly what it is that he wants, Democrats yeah. are going... I, we just can't understand what this man wants. And yeah, the it's media's just kind of eating this yeah. up. Oh, yeah, sure. Well, it's conflict. And it, conflict saves you from doing any homework. You know, I mean, uh, if you got somebody saying, oh, he's a piece of crap, and no, he's not. Uh, uh, no, I'm not. Uh, he is. And so, you have, yes, he is. No, he isn't. It's the old crossfire thing. There's no substance. Um, yeah. And by the way, Crossfire is what produced Ducker. Um, right. I remember it's yeah. a food it's a food fight, and um, I had a governor, and they invited him sometime. I said, "Nope, never going on there," because he was too intelligent. You know, he's he's going to try to explain something, and no, <laughs> yeah, you're just you're just a target. That's all, and uh, it's showbiz, if, uh, if fire and fury, and not much light no i think you're right about that and i think it's wise to stay to steer clear of those platforms for that very reason but i mean i understand media narratives but this one's getting beaten to death and and what strikes me about this one is not so much this disinformation but the fact that it's only being approached from the direction that makes the least yeah. amount of sense because yeah. what the story is here is an administration and party leadership which couldn't do math and still yeah. really isn't doing math to figure out how they were going to be able to craft an agenda for a, an evenly split Senate and an almost evenly split house. Um, it, all of these things should have been run by Joe Manchin first and Kirsten Cinema for that matter. And John Tester and, and a couple other, um, Red State, Mark Kelly, who's up for reelection, Catherine Cortez Masto, Maggie Hassan, those are the types of voices that you want to make sure that you're on board with first before you craft the agenda. Um, and it doesn't sound like anybody bothered to talk to Joe Manchin and they're still not bothering to talk to Joe Manchin about what it is he actually wants. Even though Manchin's telling any reporter that will listen what it is that he wants. He wants- uh, He's he, available. Uh, he's, yeah. he'll, take the, he'll take a call. It, you know, it's kind of like, um biden and the, the mask mandate remember he said well last year you know, we don't need any mask mandate and then he decided to have a mask mandate you don't it's just whim i'm not even sure he knows that that or that anyone dares to remind him you know sir you said uh, we didn't want that well well, and, the mass mandate, I mean, let's take a look what happened at the White House Correspondents' Dinner. We were just talking about the, the WHCD, yeah, yeah. right? You know, you you had Joe Biden saying that he was going to attend, then it decided he's not going to attend during the dinner portion, just during the remarks portion, and that he wasn't, and that he was going to leave immediately afterwards and not be in close contact with anybody. And then you see him on camera mingling with everybody in the room in close contact. Yeah. Yeah, Anthony yeah. Fauci says... Oh, I'm not going to go because I'm concerned about you know a, a, a lack of yeah, a mask yeah. mandate. And then he shows up for the for the parties that surround the White House Correspondents' Dinner, maskless apparently. Uh, yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean it's it's all kabuki theater. It's all disinformation. It is, 
and but nobody calls them on it. You know, I mean, one of my themes in the last, well, I guess you can go back to Benghazi, but there's no consequences. Right. I mean, there were consequences for Trump's behavior, I and mean, he got unelected. Um, whether you agree with the numbers or not, he's not in office. Uh, but there's no real consequences for the overwhelming hypocrisy on this. Nothing. Nobody's going to blow the whistle because they're being just as hypocritical as the people they would be writing about. Right. I mean, you see pictures of. Uh, uh, officials and media putting on masks for the stand-up interview and then taking them off right after. You know, I mean, what a crock. And you don't think the world sees this? I, I mean, this is, this is like an open mic. You can't hide. You can't hide. Joe and, Biden said it. Jill Biden just got done yeah. saying that. It was your quote from earlier in the show, right? Yeah. Joe Biden says, yeah, it's, uh, people see the totality of what it is that we say and do. Yeah, 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 exactly. Exactly. They do. They figure it out. And they may not scream every time. Certainly the media never screams, but they may not scream every time. Uh, but they register. And that's what Trump was so astute in picking up in 2015 and 16 the frustration and uh, skeptical anger that so much of the country had towards Washington uh, on both parties, which uh, consistently overpromised, underdelivered, lied, and the country is going, yeah, geez, more of this. And nobody had done anything about it. Nobody was blowing whistles until Trump came and said, I'm going to change it and called it the swamp which it was originally until Maryland didn't want the swamp. So it donated it to the federal government. Well, there you go. It's been the yeah. swamp ever since. So That's getting right. back know, to- When, when you see pictures from 1910 uh, it, in front of the Lincoln Monument, it, it was a swamp. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah that, that's all, what was it? Uh, 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 What's the name of that? Reflecting Pond come lately. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. The um, If you've ever been to Washington, D.C. in the summertime, you know it's a swamp. <laughs> it's still oh, a swamp. Lord. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's, it's just brutal. So really, even, even in late spring, it's just I was there in graduate school. I go, oh, my God. And I said to myself, I never want to work here long term. I did end up going back for various periods, but never got assigned there thank god I, yeah I, I i spent a i spent a few days there at the end of june beginning of july and i i, I was i was there and i got a uh, interview with the then ambassador um from afghanistan who was a very nice gentleman uh, i hope that he's he and his family are still alive um but um I, <laughs> it was i was so hot Oh. I was I was covered in sweat. I looked like hell. I was wearing a nice suit, right? I was actually wearing a nice suit from Men's Warehouse. Thank you very much, you elite ass <laughs> ass wipes at Politico. Um, and um, and but I mean, I was just you know just drenched, right? And I had to sit in the um, waiting room for a little bit, so I was able to kind of cool off and evaporate a bit. And they offered me some iced tea, and I would have drank it anyway, just out of being polite. But I really needed. <laughs> really needed to hydrate yeah. back up again and i don't like iced tea this was the best glass of iced tea i've ever tasted I've my ever entire had. life and the last <laughs> it's the last one too well no i've had some since then but it's still the best glass of the 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 uh, embassy of afghanistan in the united states uh, in, in washington dc serves the best damn iced tea that you'll ever have in your entire life. They were really okay, good at this. Put that down, folks. Yeah, put that down. That's not disinformation either, folks. But if you want to know more about disinformation, go over to redstate.com because the Regent of Red State has a great VIP column up. Went up on Sunday. It's still available to you if you've got a VIP membership, so be sure to check that out. But now we come down to the biggest uh, part of our weekly chats, and that's not disinformation either. The jokes of the week, Andrew. Yeah, well, they're all old these days, but Jimmy Fallon replay, he says an Aussie billionaire is building a replica Titanic. It's a great way to travel if you couldn't get a seat on the Hindenburg. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, 
uh, Letterman uh, replay from obviously years ago. He said, today is the anniversary of Osama bin Laden's killing. When the SEALs arrived, he was watching TV with his three wives. So a lot of people think it was suicide. <laughs> <laughs> please, please get me out of here. And, um, um, oh, here's, here's a good one, a, a, a Fallon replay. Heisman Trophy winner uh, Jameis Winston of Florida is in trouble for shoplifting $32 worth of crab legs from a grocery store. Experts say if he doesn't clean up his act and straighten out, he could end up in the NFL. Oh, my gosh. That'd be awful. And, and he did. Yeah. <laughs> I think he's on New Orleans at the moment. He is. He is. Um, he was injured last season, but they expect him yeah, to come back this well, season. And Yeah. Well, so. Yeah. They, and, and of course, yeah. uh, the Cleveland Browns have Deshaun Watson, too. So there you go. Oh, isn't that just three first round draft choices? Three. Oh, oh. You, you know, the Steelers had a great uh, draft this year, too. Yeah, yeah. You, you that's, gotta, that's, you, what, that's what I heard. You got to uh, come across the border. Come across oh, the border. No. To... <laughs> no, 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 no. I may be disenchanted with the Cleveland Browns, but you will never see me cheering for Pittsburgh. <laughs> never, ever, ever. I'll cheer for Cincinnati before Pittsburgh. You know, my story originally, and I'm sticking to it, was that people who, when America was moving west in the frontier days, they they were moving west. They went from up uh, up New York, upstate, then across into Pennsylvania, and they kept moving west. And when they got to the Ohio border, um, a lot of them couldn't get in, so they went back and settled Pittsburgh. <laughs> they were rejected and sent back to Pittsburgh. Disinformation, I say. <laughs> <laughs> disinformation. The disinformation and governance board is coming for you, Andrew Malcolm. <laughs> you know what? A quick, another quick story. When I was a little boy, I was a big baseball fan for a while. Cleveland Indians, of course. And I went with my dad uh, on a business trip. So we were in the old fashioned hotel. This is before air conditioning in Philadelphia. And the uh, clerk at the hotel desk saw my Indians hat and he said, Oh, are you a baseball fan? And I said, Yeah. And uh, he, he said, well, those guys sitting in the chairs over there, there were a whole bunch of uh, burly men sitting in chairs smoking cigars. He said, well, those guys are all uh, baseball players. And I said, oh, my gosh. So I got a piece of paper and a pencil, and I went over, and I got all these autographs. And I came back to the desk, and I said, I, I don't recognize any of these names. Who, who are they? And he said, oh, those are the Pirates, Pittsburgh Pirates. I said, they have a team <laughs> because you know i was american leagues i didn't really pay any attention right, yeah. to the no, national leagues. Fair. so that was news to me that pittsburgh has a baseball why don't we ever play them because <laughs> we were not in the world series until 1948 so uh and 54 my dad had tickets got tickets for him and me to go to the world series in 1954 the fifth game when the Indians lost four straight. <laughs> I, I interviewed Al Lopez years and years later. He was the coach. And I basically wanted to grab him by the lapel. I said, why did you lose four straight? And he shrugged. Because, I mean, they had the best pitchers. You know, Bob Lemon, early win, Mike Garcia, Herb Score. I mean, it was, it was a, a killer's row. I said, how did you leave? And, you know, and he shrugged and he said, uh, well, we just hit a batting slump. He said, a batting slump <laughs> in the world? You can't do that. <laughs> you have to work at that for four games. <laughs> ah, anyway, uh, I dropped baseball and I got into the Browns. And that's how I came to hate your city. <laughs> it's not even my city. I'm just it's my team, but it's not no, my I city. Know. No, but you're stuck with it. I yeah, I am. I, I'll embrace yeah. it. I'll embrace yeah. Pittsburgh. Yeah. I'm wearing yeah. black. I don't have yellow on today, but I am wearing black. So there you go. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, Andrew Malcolm, of course, is the prince of Twitter at A.H. Malcolm. You can also find him at Red State. He's the regent of Red State, redstate.com. But you can find all the links at, at A.H. Malcolm on Twitter. We'll be back with more from the Ed Morrissey Show. Just stay tuned.
Thanks for watching the Ed Morrissey Show podcast edition. If you like what you've seen, be sure to subscribe at the channel that you watched on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts. We love subscribers. More importantly, it lets everybody know that we're out there. So again, thank you for watching. Be sure to subscribe.